Hello, and welcome to our virtual public program, She Changed the World, North Carolina Women Breaking Barriers. I'm Paul Saylors, local history assistant at the Wayne County Public Library. In coordination with the State Library of North Carolina and North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, Wayne County Public Library are hosting three virtual programs that will feature powerful women from Goldsboro and celebrate their strength, resilience, courage, and bravery. This is a statewide program in which other North Carolina libraries are participating. We chose to call our local program, Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History, a quote many of us have probably seen on t-shirts and coffee mugs. These programs continue the library's stewardship by sharing the lives of three incredible women from Goldsboro, Gertrude Wheel, Ruth Whitehead Whaley, and Dorothy Foreman Cotton. Well-behaved women seldom make history is a quote by Laurel Thatcher Ulrich. Ulrich is a Pulitzer Prize winning American historian specializing in early America and the early history of women. She wrote a book of this title which reimagines female possibilities and looks at the women who didn't try to make history, but did. These three women from Goldsboro did just that. Our first program highlights Gertrude Wheel. Gertrude Wheel was an activist and organized equal suffrage leagues in North Carolina. She was born in 1879, had lived a long life, died in 1971. Our other two ladies we are featuring in the Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History series is Ruth Whaley and Dorothy Cotton. Ruth was the first black woman in North Carolina to be sworn in to practice law. Next, Dorothy Cotton from Goldsboro as well. She was a civil rights activist and leader, the highest ranking woman on Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Activist Gertrude Wheel organized the North Carolina Equal Suffrage League starting in 1913, and throughout her life remained a strong advocate for women's rights. She worked with societies both black and white, local and national, that arose in support of temperance, public health, arts, and music, women's suffrage, and against child labor. We have the fortunate pleasure to have personal family stories and insight into her civic duties. Later, we will have David and Emily Wheel speak to those points later on in the program. But let's first start with some brief history of the Wheel family. This is a family portrait of Jacob and Yetta Wheel seated in the center, surrounded by their family. Jacob Wheel, an antiques dealer from Oberdorf, Germany, and his wife Yetta, of Bavaria immigrated to Baltimore, where their five children preceded them. The oldest, Herman, joined his two sisters, Bertha and Jeanette, in Baltimore in 1858, and in that same year came to Goldsboro to clerk in a store. In June 1861, he enlisted in the Army. Immediately after the war, his brother Henry, who immigrated to Baltimore in 1860, when he was only 14 years old. Herman and Henry Wheel purchased the Edinger mercantile business in which Herman was working and opened their own store in Goldsboro. They were later joined by their younger brother, Solomon, opening the firm the following year, entitled H. Wheel and Brothers. These are the three Wheel brothers, Herman Wheel, the oldest, Henry Wheel, middle child, and Solomon, the youngest of the brothers. Henry Wheel is David Wheel's great-grandfather. The three Wheel brothers settled in Goldsboro, North Carolina in 1860s were seeking a better way of life for themselves. As young men, they rose economically from shop clerk to department store pioneers and established merchants. This is a picture of H. Wheel Brothers in 1928. 
It's their 63rd anniversary of being in business. The two brothers, Herman and Henry, opened H. Whelan Brothers only two months after Sherman's army stopped in Goldsboro in 1865. Solomon was just 17 at the time, Henry 20, Herman 24. These were very young men, but they've prospered. It was the intersection of two major railroads Goldsboro sprung up, ran from Wilmington to Weldon north and south, and Raleigh to Newburn east and west, crossed at Goldsboro. This is a 1940 newspaper article featuring the wheels of Goldsboro. It's a 75-year anniversary of H. Wheel and Brothers. They occupied a small wooden building where Henry Edinger's store had been. You can see the bottom right-hand corner. Above it is where the current buildings at the time in the 1940s occupied four buildings on Center Street, one being three stories high. At this time, Goldsboro was a budding railroad town. Up to 30 passenger trains a day would pull into Goldsboro Center Street, literally feet away from H. Wheel and Brothers department store. It quickly grew. Unfortunately, Herman Wheel passed away in 1878. Getting back to Gertrude, Gertrude was born in 1879, so she never knew her uncle Herman, who was the pioneer wheel that moved to Goldsboro. In 1890, the family donated 18 acres of land east of the city in Herman's name for a public park, Herman Park. Gertrude was 11 years old at the time. The wheel name began to carry more weight in North Carolina. A lot of public parks are on land donated to the city, county, and state, including Mina Wheel Park, Herman Park, and the Cliffs of the Noose State Park. Gertrude was the daughter of Mina Rosenthal Wheel and Henry Wheel. Mina Rosenthal Wheel, at the time of her engagement, is featured in the middle of this slide. Gertrude's earliest memory of civic duty was at the age of seven, when she helped her mother, Mina, collect donations to send to Charleston after the earthquake of 1886 ravaged the city. Well-Behaved Women examines the ways in which women shaped history, citing examples from the lives of Rosa Parks, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Harriet Tubman, and Virginia Woolf. Featured on the right is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. She, born 1815, died 1902, was a very early American suffragist, social activist, abolitionist, and leading figure of the early women's rights movement. When Wheel was 16, during 1895, she was sent to New York City to attend the Horace Mann School. During this time at Horace Mann, Wheel began writing letters home to her family, or as she titled them, her dear ones, relaying her experiences in New York. During her time at Horace Mann School, Wheel was introduced to Margaret Stanton Lawrence, daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Margaret Stanton Lawrence was Wheel's physical education teacher. Lawrence was an early influence on Wheel, with Wheel commenting after hearing Lawrence speak, Oh, you'll see me come home a thorough reformer. Wheel went on to attend Smith College. It's a private liberal arts historically women's college in Northampton, Massachusetts. Gertrude was housed during her first year at Smith College in the home of Mary Louise Cable, sister of novelist George Washington Cable, who opposed slavery and racism in his writing. During her time at Smith, Will was exposed to the work of progressive reformers like Jane Addams, attended lectures on gender inequalities, and attended lectures on women's role in confronting social justice. These experiences generated the basis for Will's future work. During the election of 1900, women had not been given the right to vote in the United States, but some women at Smith College, including Wheel, participated in a mock presidential election. Some alumni of Smith College include Sylvia Plath, Julia Child, Gloria Steinem, Nancy Reagan, 
Barbara Bush, and Margaret Mitchell. In 1901, she graduated from Smith and moved back to her hometown of Goldsboro, where she would actively begin her civic career. Her house, the Henry Wheel House, pictured here, is on the National Register for Historic Places. Its twin house to the west is the Solomon Wheel House and was Wayne County's public library at one time. Next, we will have Emily Wheel speak to Gertrude's civic duties and activism. Gertrude was born in, seven, in 1879 in Goldsboro to a family that was already quite involved in civic affairs. She was educated locally with her brothers and sisters. She had two brothers, Herman and Leslie, and one sister, Janet, who later became Janet Bleatenthal from Wilmington. Um, she was sent to New York City to be educated at Horace Mann School in high school, as we would call it. And then she went to Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, where she graduated in 1901. She was the first North Carolinian to graduate from Smith College. And if you happen not to be familiar with Smith, it's one of the seven sister so-called schools, a very well-known and respected school then and now. After college, she took some courses in uh, advanced training at Cornell and really considered staying in the Northeast because she had met so many people that were active in civic affairs at Smith. But her family convinced her that her mother was not well and that um, her mother, Mina, and her aunt, Sarah, were very involved in local affairs that could use some assistance from her. So she came back and immediately became involved in the local women's club movement, which her Aunt Sarah and her mother had helped to organize while she was at school. And her Aunt Sarah became the first president, her mother the second, and then Gertrude became president for the next three terms. And from that point on, she was constantly involved in things like um, work week cutting of hours and making sure children didn't work long hours in factories and birth control and all sorts of things that would come up. She had very strong opinions and so she would write letters to her friends all across the country. She would write letters to the Congress people in the state and at the national level. She traveled uh, to friends here, there, and yon so that she could make talks there about whatever was happening in the country or in the state at that time. She became involved in helping to establish the hospital here and became one of the, I think, the very first woman on the board. Um, she was involved with um, helping people that didn't have food. It was long before we had a soup kitchen, but she and her mother would help feed people that were hungry. They even helped establish a, a after school or a school for children of people that were working, which ultimately became so successful that it became kindergarten as we know it today and was accepted all over the country after a while. Then she became involved with things like um, various organizations she established the League of Women's Voters in this state and was its first president. And then she got involved with uh, Equal Suffrage League, which was a sort of a lead up because at that time the 19th Amendment was being considered nationally. And um, she established and became the first president of the Equal Suffrage League. And then she went for 1911, 1912, 1913, trying to get women excited about voting so that they would 
insist that this be a privilege they have, or not exactly a privilege, but a right that they have. And then in 1919, when the amendment had passed nationally, and 35 states had ratified the amendment, 36 were required for uh, it to become a law. And um, so she wanted North Carolina to be the 36th state to make it happen. She took a whole year of her life and went to Raleigh to stay with friends, spent all her time writing everybody in the state that she could think of, or going to see them, or actually lobbying people that were at the state house, trying to, to really make sure that our state became the state that made the 19th Amendment happen. Unfortunately, it did not work that way, and Tennessee became the state that made it happen. And it was not until the very year that she died that North Carolina finally ratified the 19th Amendment. And she was very proud of that. That happened right before she died. She was a fundraiser, a speaker that everyone wanted to have. Some of her other causes were that she was appointed by Roosevelt to be the director of public relief for North Carolina. And she was a friend of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Eleanor actually stayed with her at her house. Another thing that she did was to try to get some family members and others out of Germany when the Second World War was coming. She really worked hard with national senators and Congress people to try to get the paperwork that was necessary because it was very, very difficult to get people out of Germany at that time. She did get several, I think only about six family people out, but some of them, a couple of the families lived with her at her home here until they were able to find situations where they could work and live. She was a member of the Travelers Aid Society. Um, she uh, worked with the League of Nations. Uh, she chaired the International Relations Committee for the League of Nations. It just goes on and on. There was hardly any thing that was going on in the country that was an improvement for the citizens that Gertrude was not involved with. This is a wonderful photograph of Gertrude on the far left as a suffragist. The man sitting in the center, kneeling, is holding a sign, reading, Battalion of Male Sympathizers. This was a common motif of suffragist photographs of the era. In 1920, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution gave women the right to vote. Wheel and the Suffrage League lobbied the North Carolina General Assembly to ratify the amendment. This is a photograph of the Yarborough Hotel. It was the headquarters located on Fayetteville Street in Raleigh. You can see the suffragist flag in the middle of the picture with the North Carolina state flag to the right. The suffragist flag would have been purple, white, and yellow. This is a wonderful picture of Gertrude and her team inside the Yarborough Hotel. Gertrude on the far left, this is at the Equal Suffragist League headquarters in Raleigh at the Yarborough Hotel. Cornelia German sits at the desk on the right with Sally Dorch of Goldsboro beside her. The dog sitting in the chair has a collar on reading votes for women Shifting gears, we wanted to share some more personal memories of Gertrude with David and Emily. My name is David Wheel. Gertrude Wheel was my great aunt. Her lifetime home, uh, which was at the corner of James and Chestnut Street. To me, it was an old house it was poorly lit, it was dark, had a long hall with a cold floor, had a large dining room and a large library, about which I'd like to comment more later. Gertrude 
at being an older woman, but also a woman focused on social issues and politics, did not plan for children. She never had children, uh, and so she never had the opportunity to raise children. It was my family's tradition that all members of the family tried to teach the children. And it was part and parcel of that teaching that had adults get down on the floor with children. It was their belief that adults should not tower over children, that the adults should be at the same level when they talk with children. And there was particular emphasis in all the family members in reciting poetry and rhymes and rhyming games of the type that had clapping and touching the other person and different sorts of movements that went with a rhyme. It was their belief that children who were raised with those kinds of activities, it improved their math skills. I don't know if it's true or not, uh, uh, but I think all of my family were pretty proficient at math, so it may have worked. Emily, you didn't know Gertrude, of course, as early as I did, but when we began to take our children to Gertrude's house, how do my recollections compare with yours? Well, I didn't have the background you had of knowing what your parents thought about playing with children and that sort of thing. But my recollection is the first time that I went to Gertrude's house with a little child, she was so excited because this was something out of her usual routine. And she took him in, set him on the floor, and sat on the floor beside him. And she had a dress on, which was kind of awkward and strange to me. And she sat on the floor and picked up this dog-eared bean bag that looked like the beans were about to fall out and talked to the little boy, my little Steve, about it and explained that we were going to throw it over to this board. And so she sat there on the floor with my little boy who was maybe a year old at that time and threw bean bags all dressed up. And I'd never seen an adult act quite like that before. So this is one of my very first memories of Gertrude, although I have a couple of other memories sooner. Um, perhaps I can go from there into the fact that she enjoyed having people for lunch. This was her big thing of each day. She enjoyed getting a variety of people to come to her house for lunch. Her table was large, much larger than this one. She could seat probably 20, 24 people around it easily. And she would invite maybe the yard man, maybe the editor of the newspaper, maybe somebody that ran a shop down the street, perhaps the pastor of the St. Paul's Church. Anybody she ran into, she'd say, please come to my house for lunch at 12. And she just seemed to enjoy having a variety of people. And the thing that really impressed me was it wasn't ever a group that you would expect to be together. And she always sat at the end of the table and served everybody's plate. And then would engage each person, maybe not in a row, but make sure everybody was addressed. And she seemed to know something about everybody there. For example, she would know what editorial the editor had written recently, if it was a reporter. Oh, that story you wrote last week, she would know every detail. The person who worked in her yard, I do love the day lilies. You have done such a nice job. This particular color and that particular color are my favorite. And I always remember just sort of sitting there looking at her thinking, how can you know so many different people and subjects and keep, it, keep the conversation going all the time? She often got so involved in her two-way discussion or three-way that she forgot to go ahead and finish slicing the meat and maybe putting some vegetables. And it really took a long time to get your plate because eating was really not as important as conversation to her. And her conversation was always stimulating.
on occasion, she would bring in the total family. And the family was large, and we had an adult table and a children's table. And I distinctly remember being at the children's table, which was not divided by age, but rather by openings. In other words, the adults filled the big table, and you sat at the little table until there was an opening. And I thought how wonderful it will be when I get to graduate from the youth table to the big table. Well, as Emily said, Gertrude would rather talk than eat. And she was a tiny little woman, under 100 pounds. And she didn't care anything about food, but she cared everything about conversation. So the food would be slow coming. And as a young adult moving to the adult table, I thought to myself, this isn't so great. Uh, really, because the food is slow, whereas at the young table, you got your food in a hurry. So in my early graduation to the adult table, I did enjoy the conversation. But some members of my family were conservative. Most were liberal, and Gertrude was extremely liberal. And sometimes the conversations would be pointed, but never unpleasant and never accusatory, but it was clear that there was often a difference of opinion. And I remember, uh, in particular, her arguments with Herman Wheel. And I think Herman argued sometimes for the sake of getting Gertrude riled up. And I distinctly remember Gertrude one time turning to Herman and said, Herman, it is instructive to observe the gradual deterioration of your mind. <laughs> and Herman was her brother, in case. Herman you... was her brother. That's exactly right. But through it all, I was greatly influenced by the conversations that I had. And as a young person, I was as liberal as could be. Gertrude had the most marvelous library. Now, I was used to books because all of my parents, grandparents, books were everywhere. Libraries were important. Reading was critical. And my parents would provide anything I wanted to read, but generally speaking, it came from the library. But if it didn't have it in the library, I would always get the books that I needed or wanted. Gertrude had her greatest influence by the things that she read that I, in turn, read and that she shared with me through her library. And she shared it with everybody at lunch, too, because she would let them know what had been said in San Francisco on this very same subject. And she really had a knowledge that was unique at the time. One of the first things that impressed me about Gertrude, she, of course, wanted to involved me in a very deep conversation to find out what I'd read, where I'd studied, what my interests were, and all this sort of thing. And she, of course, knew all about the teachers I'd had. I'd been at Meredith College, and she was very familiar with it, um, although she had graduated from Smith College, which is in Massachusetts. But um, she, she discovered that I was really interested in music, and that I had studied music at Meredith. And she said, well, one of my best friends is Nell Hirschberg, who happens to run the music department at St. Mary's College, which was a college at that time, a junior college. And she said, let me see what I can do. Maybe I can help you in some way with music. And I thought, well, okay. So she called me about the next day and said, I've arranged for you to have lessons every week with Nell Hirschberg and my yard man is going to drive you up each week. So will you be ready on Wednesdays at 10 o'clock and we will take you to Raleigh and you will have lessons. And I had the most wonderful private voice lessons for over a year that she just arranged because she knew that I had studied music and enjoyed singing and music. And um, this was the way she was. If she knew something was important to you, she would try to help in some way increase your knowledge or your ability to develop in that field.
I was in the wheels department store one day, as I frequently was at that time, and Gertrude was standing there in the maternity department looking at the dresses. And I said, oh, Gertrude, have you a friend that's about to have a baby? And she said, well, probably, but I don't know who it would be. And I said, well, I was just wondering about your looking at these dresses. And she said, they just look so comfortable. I think I'll get a variety of them and I'll wear them. Fashion didn't mean anything to Gertrude, but comfort did. <laughs> she was, in fact, a Sunday school teacher for many years, and I was a student. And part of my learning and part of the influence that Gertrude had was in those lessons, not Bible lessons. That wasn't Gertrude's fashion, but justice and treating your fellow man fairly it was always the text of the day. Gertrude lived to be 91 years of age. It was a very long time in that period. But I remember that Gertrude retained her interest in everything that was going on up until the very end. Emily, I know you told me an interesting story because you and my daughter Leslie visited Gertrude on the day before she died. We That's didn't, of true. course, have any idea. And she had some interesting questions for you and Leslie. Would you mind mentioning that? Sure. Um, Leslie was probably in the second grade, maybe, and uh, we were telling Gertrude about a new procedure that the school was trying at that time. It was called open classroom. And instead of having like three second grades, they might have a large room and there would be all the students in the same room and they would have different areas for reading and for math or for remedial work if a student needed help. And there would be teachers and aides, probably five or six people in one open classroom. And we were discussing this with Gertrude and she was fascinated. And she said, oh, I've always been so interested in how they educate children and hoping that they're doing it properly so that they'll be better adults when they grow up. And she looked at me and said very, very seriously, you know, I think that I need to see this in person so that I can really understand how it works. Will you help me arrange for someone to take me so that I can sit and watch how an open classroom works? And this was like the day before she died. She was literally on her bed and she could sit with a pillow, but she was still so terribly interested that she wanted to get out of bed and go immediately just because this was a new concept in education. And she really loved new concepts. Which reminds me, <laughs> uh, there are so many things about Gertrude, but she marched with the early marchers. We are all aware of the marching that's been done recently because of the killing. And um, one thing that she marched when uh, the local board was trying to see that people who were on welfare use their money wisely, they were trying to pass a ruling that you couldn't have a television set if you took welfare. And Gertrude thought this was horrible. Now, she never had a TV, and she never wanted a television because to her that just took time from reading and doing important things that you should be doing. But she felt that you had a right to do it, and that if this was something that would help you, you should be allowed to do it, whether you needed government assistance or not. So she marched for that, and she was always out there at the forefront of people trying to have equal rights. If she were living today, she would have been one of the people that were demonstrating, I'm sure, because she always did. She always did all that she could to make the world a better place. This was the kind of person she was. Thank you for joining us for our She Changed the World, North Carolina Women Breaking Barriers. Special thanks to the State Library of North Carolina the North Carolina Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, and the North Carolina State Archives.